All right, now a little bit about our amazing speakers today, and then we will get things going. First up, we have Nikhil Lai, who is a senior analyst at Forrester, and his research focuses on the evolution of performance marketing, including retail media, SEM and SEO, TV, and creative. Nikhil's passion for apprehending what performance means, now that every channel parades as performance and contends with data, data depreciation, comes from his empathy for performance marketers. He was a performance marketer at GE when the company underwent frame-breaking digital transformation and then evangelized cross-channel TV advertising and multivariate creative testing for performance marketers. Next, we have Jerry Bell, um, who is the Director of Product Marketing at Vidmo where he is responsible for leading go-to market and pricing strategy. Before working in product marketing, Jerry helped build out the Vidmob par Partnerships organization, ensuring mutual business impact between clients and Vidmob's largest platform partners. Prior to joining Vidmob, he worked in multiple roles across J.P. Morgan's asset management division. Jerry received his BA from Columbia University, where he was a letterman on the Lion football team, and he lives in New York City. City. Well, needless to say, we have two um, very knowledgeable and capable folks on the line with us today. I'm very excited to dig into this content because performance marketing is a very top of mind for our audience. So without further ado, Nikhil, I'm going to pass the conversation over to you. Welcome. Great. Thanks so much, Alicia. Um, so for context, um, the economic turmoil that is trailing in the wake of COVID-19 continues to persist. And CMOs can't just dust off their recession playbooks from years past and expect to understand, let alone serve consumers today. Because the unique combination of social, economic, and political tensions at this moment are shaping when, where, and why consumers are willing to open up their wallets this holiday season. So Forrester's 2022 Consumer Energy Index and Retail Pulse surveys have revealed some interesting data that we'll walk through today um, to um, give some perspective on how consumers are going to spend um, and more broadly behave um, this uh, holiday season and how that can impact your marketing strategy. So uh, to kick off, consumers we see in our data are torn between wanting to believe in a relatively smooth post-pandemic recovery while also facing a lot of fear. So since 2020, we've seen in our research that consumers have been desperate for a sense of normalcy. Um, but, you know, the devastating war in Ukraine, mass shootings, controversial landmark rulings by the, by the, by the Supreme Court, they've shocked consumers back into states of um, fear and chaos. And so consumers desire to believe in a pandemic rebound, clash with you know, persistent crises, um, uh, which uh, leaves consumers with a lot of uncertainty. So at the end of Q3, we're seeing that uh, US consumers are, are split 50-50 in terms of um, whether they fear the rise of uh, COVID variants and also whether they believe that they can handle the economic impact of the pandemic. And so to kick off on this slide, um, consumers are bracing for recession, but their actual behavior changes depending on their age and their income. So as I mentioned, uh, extraordinary uncertainty is pervasive. The University of Michigan survey of consumers found that sentiment is at an all-time low, while uncertainty around long-term inflation has hit its highest point in about 30 years. And so our data shows that younger consumers are less sensitive to and less prepared for the financial impact of a potential recession. So about 40%, as you can see here on this slide, about 40% of Gen Z consumers believe that fears about an upcoming recession are greatly exaggerated, whereas only 24% of Gen X and only 12% of baby boomers believe that those fears are exaggerated. A few more data points here to add some nuance to the story is that about 35% of Gen Z consumers feel confident about how to manage their finances during an economic downturn, whereas about 50% of Gen X and about 50% of baby boomers feel confident about how to manage their finances. And higher income consumers, somewhat unsurprisingly, remain less price sensitive um, 
than lower income groups. So consumers with household incomes of $150,000 or more are more likely to say that tangible goods make them happy. They're less likely to notice um, recent rising prices, and they're less likely to revise down their budgets, especially for categories like travel and well-being. So to speak more specifically about how budgets are going to change in the next few months, we're seeing overall that consumers are prepared to pull back on discretionary spend while stocking up on consumer staples. So on average, about four in 10 consumers expect to spend less on leisure travel, cosmetics, fitness memberships during the next three months relative to the previous three months. Um, the pandemic-driven boom in home improvement is fizzling out. So about 38% of consumers expect to spend less on home, on home improvement. And in anticipation of cutting back on dining out, about 25% of consumers are prepared to increase their spend on groceries. And most of the folks are telling us that they're going to trade down to private labels. Um, nearly half of U.S. consumers say that news about the state of the economy influences what they buy. Um, and so I want to set context for how consumers are thinking about the next three months, then speak a bit about what it means for marketing. And so we're seeing specifically um, that channels like search and like retail media that are able to verify their revenue impact and to prove their yield, um, they are the least vulnerable to budget cuts in Q4 and heading into next year. And marketers' hands are being forced anyway by data deprecation to invest in channels that are less vulnerable to you know, browser-based cookie deprecation or operating system restrictions like iOS 14. A few more points on um, the supply chain crisis, and then we'll talk about how to market during a downturn. Um, we've partnered with uh, 8451, for example, to do some research about how consumers um, are you know testing out different um, uh, types of brands um, now that um, their preferred uh, brand might not be as readily available. And we're finding that 90% of consumers are willing now to test a lesser known, lower cost brand if that preferred choice is not available. And um, according to IRI, brands, especially this year with low availability or lower than average in stock rates have lost close to a percentage point of share of wallet so far this year. So there are lots of crises out there. Um, but for marketers, now it's really time to be opportunistic. And so I was speaking to the, to the CMO of a, finan of, a of a financial services brand um, who told me that, you know, trying to recompete after cutting budget costs you more than you will save. And so um, he's looking at this moment to make a lasting impression with consumers bearing in mind you know how they're thinking about all the uncertainty and, and all the fear that's currently conditioning their behavior you know so lasting impressions building up pent-up demand when it's less expensive to do so building share of voice brand equity brand salience brand energy when, it, when it's less expensive to do so because he realizes that losing share of voice now is going to cause him to spend more to recover that share of voice than he would have to if he just maintained share of voice throughout and we're finding as well that about 86% of executives say that when they see advertising from a company during a recession, it keeps that company top of mind when making purchase decisions and makes consumers feel positive. It, it, it you know, confers credibility, goodwill. It confers halo effects on that, on that company's commitment to its products and to its services. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, the marketers that I'm talking to are, are you know, proactively building a pent-up demand right now because they realize that it's cost-effective to do so um, given, given uh, the uh, conditions um, that they're facing today. And I mentioned, I mentioned data deprecation, and I also wanted to tie this into um, the importance of creative um, as well and then pass it on to Vidma to, to, to speak more specifically about some creative best practices this holiday season, but we're asking broadly about you know, how CMOs are dealing with data deprecation, which refers to the confluence of browser-based cookie deprecation, as well as operating system restrictions, as well as consumers' dissatisfaction with advertising expressed by the prevalence of tools like, like um, ad blockers, for example. Um, and so about 35% of CMOs tell us that they're preparing for this force by updating their ad tech stack 
to make sure that partners, i.e. agencies, you know, have future-proof solutions and have robust roadmaps to manage data deprecation using strategies like zero and first-party data capture, for example, figuring out how much um, known and unknown customer data they have that they can activate in media plans and activate in email streams to, to uh, lift loyalty. But interestingly, um, about 30% of CMOs are talking about the importance of creative testing um, as an antidote to the signal lost caused by um, um, uh, things like iOS 14. Uh, and similarly, contextual targeting is also being seen um, as a solution to um, uh, audience targeting tactics that marketers have, his, uh, have, have historically relied on now being less available, given, as I mentioned, you know, the operating system restrictions and browser-based cookie deprecation that we expect to see in a couple of years. Um, so the importance of creative testing is something that I hear about every day from Forces clients. I'm getting lots of questions about how to, you know, consistently build more compelling creative, how to test creative before they run, for example, broadcast TV spots or even Facebook ads, um, even audio ads, you know, how to test the text of um, podcast ads to make sure that it's using keywords that are going to cause, you know, the lowest cost per lead or the lowest cost per acquisition. And so I'm hearing a lot about creative testing, um, about where to, about where creative testing fits in the workflow with things like dynamic, with things like dynamic creative optimization. Um, and so for um, more details on uh, creative testing and creative best practices, um, I will pass it over to the Vidmob team. Thank you very much. That was uh, fantastic. Um, so I know it's only September, but I do think it'd be a good idea to kind of sort of get folks in the holiday spirit a little bit. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what um, I would call the naughty list. So in this case, um, the naughty list is kind of referring to what we see as some kind of common marketer mistakes um, that can really prevent um, brands from kind of achieving their goals during the, the kind of holiday season. Um, so to start, um, I think the first thing would be um, to really overlook a lot of the kind of behavioral changes that we just talked about, right? Um, these days, consumers are starting to shop much, much earlier in the process. Um, gone are the days of the kind of Cyber Five, right? The, the Black Friday to Cyber Monday. Reality is consumers are making shopping decisions much, much earlier in the process. Um, they're mindful of things like uh, shipping delays and supply chain challenges. Um, marketers who struggle to kind of get creative live quickly and, and while shoppers are making these kind of purchase decisions um, may miss out on kind of those, those shoppers who are considering things earlier in the process. A second big mistake we see um, is really only focusing on primary campaign channels. Um, some really interesting research from Google recently show that um, omni-channel shoppers, so shoppers who are um, looking uh, at, at information from three or more channels, um, shoppers who kind of do this are twice as likely to purchase and, and spend twice as much money as shoppers who are evaluating products um, with just one or two chance, uh, channels. Um, marketers really need to be present across these various buyer touch points, or they obviously kind of risk awareness and consideration lapses. Um, and then lastly, um, another big mistake we see marketers making is kind of only limiting their creative to what we would call platform best practices, right? Um, this year, I think we can expect an especially noisy holiday season. We have elections in the U.S. Um, there's a World Cup for the first time of the winter. Um, I think it's, it's realistic to expect higher holiday CPMs. Marketers with kind of without a unique voice and a unique creative insight um, risk kind of blending into the crowd. Um, and that's something obviously we would want to recommend marketers avoid. Um, so how to kind of get off that naughty list onto the nice list. So kind of I provide a few recommendations that, that we've seen um, some leading marketers um, have success with. Um, the first is to kind of meet market, meet shoppers where they are. Um, we see really, we see a lot of uh, success um, with clients of ours who are using kind of innate, you know, efficient production resources to get campaign creative live as quickly as possible, right? Um, the more, uh, the more kind of touch points you can have with the buyer, the earlier, the better. Um, as I said, marketers are really knowledgeable these days. They're making, they're taking longer to make buying decisions. Really need to be having a need to be resonating with that audience sooner. Um, secondly, we see, uh, um, we recommend kind of considering all the possible channels where your audience may be uh, making buying decisions, um, leveraging kind of expertise. Um, to build native creative for all of these places, especially the ones where people are making specific buying decisions. Um, think the e-commerce websites. 
Um, if you have creative that resonates with an audience there, um, we believe you're much more likely to kind of um, uh, connect with that audience who's making that buying decision. The last place um, um, we, we really kind of help our, our clients kind of overcome these mistakes is um, kind of going beyond the, the kind of standard platform best practices um, to really kind of leverage all of the available advantages they have um, to understand what creative elements are really going to drive performance on the specific channels um, to kind of achieve that successful holiday creative campaign that we're, that we're really looking for um, amidst this kind of the turmoil that Nikhil was really talking about. Um, so to kind of take a slight step back, I want to take a little bit of time to talk about um, where we see kind of sophisticated marketers using creative as a business lever this holiday season. Um, at VidMob, you know, we believe strongly that marketers can really only change what they can measure. And historically, creative performance, so the why behind why some creative assets work and some others don't, has been often very difficult for marketers to understand. Um, at VidMob, you know, we solve this by helping marketers kind of get a handle on what we call their creative data. So creative data is all of the various elements in a creative asset. Um, the colors used, uh, branding and logos, you know, what products appear on screen, how they're displayed, even the talent that's showing up in a piece of creative. All of these various data, data points make up what we call creative data. So every piece of creative has hundreds of different data points that can help explain and influence the way that audiences react to creative. Um, at VidMob, we analyze this data against creative performance, right? So how are the campaigns actually performing versus their intended audiences and objectives um, on the channels that they're running on? Um, when we look at these two pieces of data together, we're able to give marketers the most granular understanding of their creative possible. And with this information, we can really start to define how a marketer's creative decisions are helping, or more importantly, hurting campaign performance. These insights, along with our platform and industry expertise, can provide marketers with concrete responses to the types of business questions they've long struggled to answer. Um, holistically, we call this intelligent creative. Um, is really a, a huge advantage that we see marketers use in the holiday season. So um, back to the holidays. So what kind of things can you learn from analyzing creative data? You know, we recently conducted a study to examine the anatomy of what we consider a successful holiday ad. And these, um, the, I'm going to walk through a few examples of insights that we kind of pulled for brands. Um, and hopefully some of these will kind of resonate with you as you're starting to think about um, the different ways that you can kind of reach your audience this, this, uh, this season. Um, so one of the first things we saw is that Winter and kind of snow-related elements had huge impacts on purchase rates, um, showing you know anywhere between 600 to 800 percent increases over the industry average on Facebook and Instagram. If it's appropriate for your brand, perhaps consider cold, snowy, wintry visuals and text treatments um, when building holiday creative. Color is also really important. Um, we saw high what we considered high color contrast assets, things that are vibrant joyful um, messaging that kind of pops from the creative. Um, these things led to over overperformance on Facebook and Instagram. Specifically, interestingly, the color blue um, helped actually increase purchase rates on Facebook by 50%. During the very noisy holiday season, really important to make sure your message is actually kind of reaching your audience. High color contrast can be a way to make sure that happens. Um, so setting, right, the, the, what's actually happening in your creative, the kind of styling, the setting of the, also has a huge impact on performance. Um, outdoor and urban elements actually hurts conversion rates. So 95% um, and 50% lower than industry on both, on both uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, during the holidays, when it may be cold outside, the weather's probably less enjoyable, could be wet, um, consider bringing your audience inside to kind of enjoy what we would call the great indoors. Um, Another one, so think through messaging, right? Um, obviously, promotions are always top of mind this time of year. Um, in consecutive years, a leading client of VidMobs um, saw that um, comparing, uh, they kind of ran a test to compare promotional messaging versus kind of holiday and seasonal messaging, and promotional messaging outperforms year to year um, and uh, relates to getting audi their audience to kind of click. 
So um, the tip here, as much as some shoppers love the holidays, um, sometimes they love a sale even. Um, so lastly, a little takeaway, we also look really closely at calls to action, see what kind of um, what CTAs are having the highest uh, click-through rates for retail and e-commerce brands. Um, for CTAs in the first two seconds of a video, we saw the word buy having the um, highest impact on click-through rate versus get, shop, swipe, and save. Um, our recommendation, you know, get straight to the point, use, um, use buy in the first two seconds to kind of uh, drive your audience to, uh, to click. So um, those are a few. Those are some examples of, of insights that we that we uh, kind of uh, pulled for some of our clients. With the holidays around the corner, we recommend leveraging all of the tools at your disposal um, to truly stand out this year. And kind of learn what could ultimately impact your brand and to really drive performance this year. All right, excellent. Definitely some excellent food for thought, guys. Thank you so much. And we do have some very interesting follow-up questions um, coming down the pike here. Um, just a reminder for everyone watching, again, use that Q&A widget um, if you have any specific questions or follow-up questions after going through all of the content. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Um, first up, um, so this is an interesting question. So how should we as marketers, brand stewards, and advertisers be evolving the way we test creative? Jerry, this may be a good question for you. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I think about creative testing, um, ultimately what I think about is, you know, the purpose of creative testing is really, how do I, for, how do I find the kind of best performing assets um, to kind of power my campaigns? Um, at VidMob, we kind of think that there's two kind of key ingredients for that. Um, the first you really need an understanding of kind of how the creative decisions that you're making are really impacting performance, right? Um, what, um, to really understand the why behind the creative that I'm building, what is driving an action or an inaction from my audience? Um, but that's not enough. Once you kind of have that insight, you also have the you also need the ability to kind of do something with do something with it. That's really the second ingredient. Um, so the ability to kind of take those insights and action them by kind of applying learnings and building new, better performing creative assets with those insights. Um, so, you know, the insight and the action, the production, the new asset, those are the two things we really see as kind of um, fundamental to creative testing. Awesome. Nikhil, anything awesome. to add there? Yeah, um, I would add that um, the analytical efficiency that Jerry talked about is really important, as is workflow efficiency in the creative process. And so um, finding ways to automate the creative testing workflow, I think is really important. Um, but more importantly, generating a variety of, of creative and potentially a really big variety of creative to create um, a lot of volatility in your creative test so that so that you can quickly learn um, which variables are outperforming, which are underperforming. And so that, you know, high volume of creative assets and being able to automate the workflow to actually create that, you know, su that substantial volume is going to help you uh, reduce the time to value to actually learn which variables um, of the creative, be it, you know, a shade of orange or the placement of a call to action in a video, which variables are actually, um, you know, outlying winners or outlying losers um, in your ads. That's great. A quick follow-up question there, if I, if I may, Nikhil. So is it best to focus on, so like each individual test should be like a specific color or element just so like it's isolated, but like the elements themselves need to be different enough so you can understand yeah. the variance. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, I think that multivariate creative testing is a pretty effective way to do it. Um, and so, you know, that would be combining a bunch of different variables, say four different calls to action, two different colors, you know, three different product images, a few different UGC models, if we're talking about videos, and then combining, you know, four times two times two times two, however many variables you have. And that's what I mean by creating a pretty volatile test. And then you'll quickly learn, um, you know, which of those four, which of those two, which of those, you know, three to five different variables are actually causing the ads to, to win or lose. Um, and so that's why it's important to have, you know, workflow automation applied to the, the creative testing process, as well as the sort of analytical efficiency 
and intelligent creative data that um, Jerry was talking about. Awesome, very helpful. Okay, um, someone is asking about signal loss or you know, third-party cookies no longer mm -hmm. <laughs> being a resource. So I know it's top of mind for a lot of folks. Nikhil, you mentioned it um, during your presentation. So what do you find the best advertisers are already doing to prepare for this? Yeah, I can go first. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, to your point, I hear about this every day. Um, and uh, the best and like the savviest marketers are doing two things. They are um, figuring out how to consistently develop more compelling creative. And they're also testing into contextual targeting. Um, but specifically on creative, they're realizing that they no longer have um, signals about what consumers are in market for. So like, for example, Alicia, without your last 10 credit card purchases, I, you know, I can't predict what you're in market for. And I probably shouldn't be able to predict that because it would be too invasive if I had that information. And so consumers, by putting up ad blockers, by voting for you know, laws that are inhibiting access to their data, they're saying, look, um, you, you should not be able to predict what I'm in market for, but therefore your creative needs to be more compelling than it ever has been to bring me into market as a consumer for your goods and services. And so marketers realize that, you know, especially on Facebook and Instagram, the performance since iOS 14 took effect has been impacted in CPAs. I mean, I was talking to the CMO of a brand who said that um, her CPA was up, was up triple digits and that her spend was down close to 90% on Instagram since I was 14 because she's no longer sure exactly if she's reaching the right person at the right time with the right message. And so um, she realizes that uh, creative and contextual are kind of like the last two performance levers for her. She can no longer create, you know, an increasingly high intent audience because she doesn't have that audience data. And so in terms of creative, um, she was able to improve her CPA, I think by 50% on Instagram by realizing that certain product images have, you know, have a have a fifty percent lower CPA than others, or certain background images, certain certain landscapes, uh, certain words as well, certain value propositions have a lower CPA than others, and so um, that I think is um, the most effective way to cope with signal loss. Great, Jerry. Anything on your side? Yeah, no, I, I would you know kind of co-sign everything Nikhil just said. I think you know the the signal loss. The effects of signal loss really are kind of shifting the levers that a lot of kind of marketers have at their disposal, right? And, and creative is really just kind of taking on more, a more, um, you know, a greater, uh, you know, higher, <laughs> a a larger kind of focus area. Um, marketers are data driven, and so um, they need they're looking for better ways to kind of get data from their creative. And I think that's kind of what um, Nikhil's ultimately getting at. Um, the CMO that he was kind of referring to, looking kind of testing background imagery. Um, these are places that a lot of marketers have never really had to kind of poke around at. Um, tools like FidMobs and others that help help them kind of pull out those insights um, are going to kind of be a really really powerful kind of arrow in, in leading marketers, whoever I would say. Okay, awesome. So I think we have time for one more question or so. Um, so someone wants to know why it's more important than ever to budget for or invest in a creative tech solution. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of folks on the line, their, their budgets are being more closely scrutinized. They have to kind of validate their investments, you know, get those proof points um, in, in check. So Nikhil, any thoughts there? Yeah, um, it's more important than ever because of the data that uh, I showed about um, the fact that, to your point, budgets are being more 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 closely scrutinized. We got a data point back that about forty percent of CFOs believe that marketing budgets should not be protected during a downturn, uh, and that stat is so ominous, uh, given the you know the news that we see uh, from around the world every day, including today with the Fed raising rates and and, and, and you know what that's doing to the equity markets, and so. Um, the point is that um, budgeting for creative testing and investing in getting creative intelligence data that you can use to consistently improve the performance of 
your ads is is savvy because um, because you can prove the revenue impact that more compelling creative actually leads to. You know, you you can prove the yield that more compelling creative actually actually delivers, and so that's why we're seeing budgets in search or retail media being the last to get cut. You know, they're the least vulnerable to CFO scrutiny because the proof is uh, in the pudding there. And I think it's a similar story with creative. And so, you know, we're seeing so much um, proof across the industry and it's not really specific to verticals or to types of creative. This applies to TV ads, this applies to podcast ads. As I mentioned, this applies, of course, to UGC ads on TikTok, which are becoming a greater, and gre a greater and greater share of marketers' budgets, and so you know the creative testing budget, which is typically I hear around ten to ten to twenty percent of the overall budget, is typically what I'm hearing as a best practice. And so, if you're spending a hundred grand on Instagram for one month, for example, taking ten k of that roughly and investing that into you know, maybe three or four different tests, some static, some video, gleaning a lot of creative insight from that, you know, a lot of intelligence data. Um, that you can then use to save money and saving time during that process by automating the, the creative production workflow um, is is also you know a big value add and so um, for those reasons uh, I think it's I think it's a really good use of money right now. Awesome, super insightful. I, I think it's interesting. It kind of ties back to your point around, mm -hmm. you know, um, that there are there are benchmarks and quote unquote best yep. practices, but you don't really know how those those and uh, those ideas or those right. creative decisions perform until you actually put it into market and test it. So, right, exactly, exactly. And and it's it's kind of funny to me because every other part of the advertising process has been made more rigorous. You know, audience targeting has been made super super rigorous, but creative. Um, remains this domain in which there's a lot of guesswork still involved, and there's a lot of arbitrary, you know, arbitrary decision making. And sometimes it's the highest paid person in the room who decides how an ad looks or feels. And that, you know, marketers cannot afford to rely um, on guesswork. They cannot afford to rely on arbitrary decision making at a time when every dollar needs to be held accountable to delivering revenue impact. Yeah. Absolutely. I think those um, takeaways that you shared around like the CPA costs and, and you know, the impact mm -hmm. that you that, you know, that person was able to see just mm -hmm. by, um, you know, testing more intelligently. I yep. think that's a really big takeaway um, for everybody yep. watching I agree. right now. All right. Awesome. I agree. Well, um, folks, sadly, we are just about out of time today. Uh, super insightful presentations, conversations. Um, you know, I think in this time where there are so many different channels and, and platforms to engage with consumers and different platforms, you know, are ideal for different types of content and different types of ads, you know, can easily get a little overwhelming and, you know, confusing probably for creatives and for performance marketing teams. So hopefully this conversation today um, provided a good benchmark or or, um, or outline of topics to discuss with your team. Um, if for any reason you want to come back to this session, um, it is available on demand after this uh, live date here. So feel free to go back to it, share it with your team, get some more insights and takeaways to apply to your holiday strategies and beyond. Um, but Sally, that is it for us now. Um, if your questions were not answered, again, we will make sure someone from the VidMob team responds or our team will respond, make that connection for you so you can keep the conversation going. And um, definitely join us for our next presentation because we are going to be digging into the evolution of the online consumer. It's going to be starting at 1 p.m. Eastern and our e-commerce editor, Nicole Silverstein, will be um, leading the charge there. But for now, thanks again to um, the VidMob team, to Forrester, and to all of you for joining us. Take care, everyone.